Hello, Mr. Gay Hendricks. How are you? The man himself. I am uh, absolutely fine. How are you today? I am doing great. I am. Oh, my gosh. I've been looking forward to this for ages. I love your work. Love, love, love. And I can't, I mean, I just feel like there are so many questions I have for you. And I'm so thrilled to have your time and your your kindness in terms of showing up for this. So thank you, Dr. A pleasure. Gay. And uh, what part of the world are you in? Um, I'm based in Miami, but I'm originally from the UK. And I lived in Australia and then New York. So my uh, my I have a weird hybrid accent. <laughs> Where are you? Uh, I'm in um, Ojai, California. Um, mm. Do you know where Ojai is? I know. I think that's where Byron Katie lives. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a really uh, like gorgeous spot, isn't it? Oh, it's a beautiful little mountain valley. I've lived here for many years, mm. uh, 20 some years and um, wow. love it. It's beautiful. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a little town of about 10,000, but there's a lot of people from Hollywood that live up here, a lot of writers and artists and directors and actors and folks like that. So it's a very rich community. It's a very exciting place to be, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Well, uh, I would I know I have you for an hour and I've got lots of questions, my friend. <laughs> so I'm going to read your intro and I mean it's already recording but I edit it uh, so it's nice and tight um it all are we, are we all good any questions you have for me before we kick off I know you do a lot of these <laughs> yeah <laughs> probably nothing new but maybe a couple of new things today from me because I'm always always looking for a new question to be asked I think this is about my 2700th interview in my career so uh, <laughs> ask me something brand new Okay, you got it, Dr. Gay Hendricks. <laughs> okay, so I'll just say three, two, one, we'll go in and then we'll take it away. Does that sound good? Perfect. Fantastic. Okay, I'm just going to, uh, okay, pull up your bio here. You've got a nice, impressive bio too. So, okay, three, two, one. Welcome, Dr. Gay Hendricks. Oh my gosh, <laughs> what an honor to be speaking with you after following your work for years and having had your work and some of the acronyms that you use active in my home, in my marriage all the time. We talk about the <laughs> we talk about the ALP, the good old upper limit, which we're going to be diving into. And I was also blessed to be featured in your recent book, Conscious Luck with Carol. Yes, it gave us a great story. Yeah, yeah, I tell you, I mean, all the books, this is my copy of The Big Leap. I lost the cover. This is how much it's been read. <laughs> <laughs> good, I like that. That's what an author likes to see as a good used book. A very used book. Everything's dogged. I'm sure I've spilled 14 cups of tea over it over the years, but it's one of my most prized possessions. So thank you for writing it and being here with us. I would like to introduce uh, you to our audience just by reading out a bit about you and then we'll dive into our questions. So we're very lucky friends today. We have a Dr. Gay Hendricks who's been a leader in the fields of relationship transformation and body mind transformation for more than 45 years. Wow. After earning his PhD from Stanford in 1974, Gay served as a professor of counseling psychology at the University of Colorado. He's written more than 40 books, what a treat, including bestsellers such as Five Wishes, The Big Leap with No Cover, <laughs> Conscious Living and Conscious Loving Ever After. The last two co-authored with your wife, Dr. Kathleen or Kate Hendricks. You're also, um, Gay Hendricks is also a mystery novelist for the series of five books featuring the Tibetan Buddhist private detective, Tenzing Norbu, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Ooh. That's right. As well as a new mystery series featuring a Victorian era London detective, Sir Errol Hyde. His latest book, Conscious Luck, <laughs> reveals eight ways to change your fortunes through the power of intention. Gays appeared on more than 500 radio and television shows, including Oprah, CNN, CNBC, 48 Hours, and others. And his new book, The Genius Zone, will be published in June 2021. Can't wait for that. That is fast approaching. Yes, so <laughs> just a couple of months lucky and lucky us to get you now as we lead up to that awesome book launch too so dr gay hendrix for those of us who don't know i would love to dive straight into this concept that you coined the upper limit problem we call it the alt at home here mm -hmm. we use it freely i know you ask this a lot but i would love for you just to explain in your own words what it means 
Yes, the upper limit problem is the tendency to sabotage ourselves when things start going better. Mm -hmm. uh, it's as if we have a built-in upper limit on how much positive energy we can feel, how much love, how much money we can make, how much of a contribution we can make. Early programming puts these limiting beliefs in our heads about how much love we can experience or how much success we can experience. So later on in life, what happens is things start moving better for you. You start learning some things, but then up come these old limiting beliefs from the past and pull you back down. So um, what the book, The Big Leap is all about, as you know, is all about how to spot those upper limits and what they're based on and how to clear them up so you can live in your genius zone all the time. And The Big Leap was about how to get into your genius zone and the new book, The Genius Zone, is about how to live there 24 hours a day. Mm, oh, the genius zone. I cannot wait to get my hands on that. One thing that uh, I wanted to share with you is when I was reading The Big Leap the first time, I was on vacation in Miami where I live now with my husband and life was good in that moment. Work was good. We were having a great time. We just ordered lunch and there was nothing to complain about in that moment. Uh, and I just picked a fight. <laughs> yeah, that's the upper limit problem oh my gosh and I was reading the book and I'm like huh I know this is true the words that I'm reading immediately and then I was I, I had an idea that we should be doing maybe something else that day we shouldn't just be lounging around the pool we should be active vacationers and Heath my husband was like what's wrong with you like we're having a good time and I'm like it's 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 as simple yet insidious and invisible as that Yes, it is. It's like a glass ceiling that you don't notice until you bump up against it. Mm -hmm. And the, the interesting thing about it is that in my own case, I started, I found this in myself when I was, oh, probably now 30, 35 years ago, I started noticing my own tendency to upper limit myself. The first thing I noticed, I, I was um, overweight at the time and I was trying to lose some weight and I would be on my diet really do well for about three days. Mm -hmm. And then it was almost like I unconsciously would kind of go into a trance and eat a whole bunch of things that weren't good for me. And then, you know, I'd, I'd lose a pound or two over the few days and then zip, I'd gain it all back. And so I started, why am I doing that? And I realized ultimately, and it's a realization that has kept the weight off me ever since, mm -hmm. is that I had some kind of upper limit on how good I could allow myself to feel. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I imprinted that at an early age because every time I got to a place of feeling really good, I would do something to mess it up. Mm -hmm. And I noticed at the same time, I, uh, this was in my pre Katie days before I met my wife and uh, my girlfriend and I, we would get along well for a few days or sometimes even a week or two. And then one of us would pick a fight and there it would go, you know, and then we would de down into a spiral for a few days and then it would take us a while to get out of it. I'm, I've never been one that could just snap out of it. You know, it sort of takes me some healing time after I've been in a big domestic drama of some time. Yes. And um, so I started noticing that and that's when I began to call it the upper limit problem. And fortunately, at the same time, I was doing a lot of therapy work with some really brilliant people that were being sent to me. And I, at the time, I was just coming out of Stanford where I got my PhD and I was still working there in the Bay Area for a year after I, uh, before I went out to Colorado to take a professor job out there in the counseling psychology department. And I was working with a lot of these high tech executives that were in those early companies that are now huge companies like Hewlett Packard and Intel at the time in the 1970s, they were just kind of getting underway, but they had these most brilliant people. And in therapy, I discovered one after the other, they would have a big breakthrough and thought something would go well at work. Then they'd go home that night and have a huge blowout argument with family, you know? Yes. Why is that? You know, that, so that's when I started really looking into where the upper limit problem comes from and particularly how we can fix it. 
this is revolutionary if you allow it in, right? Because sometimes we think, oh, this is just, you know, how life works or, well, of course you fight. That's just what spouses do. Or, you know, sometimes you lose money or sometimes, you know, you have a DUI. I mean, uh, whatever it may be. I was actually just, when I've written about your work, Gay, I've mentioned that, you know, I call it sometimes referring to the Oscars curse. Have you heard of the Oscars curse where you win the golden statuette and it's a very high probability that you're going to get a divorce? Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah, so uh, an actor or an actress often who wins the, the this, you know, coveted uh, Oscar often gets divorced. There's been articles about it. There's been weird statistics on it. Um, or otherwise, they'll have some type of DUI or some type of issue with substances that becomes public. And I'm like, it's that upper limit problem. <laughs> That's kind you of know, what I keep um, coming back to. I, uh, I follow golf. I watch golf <laughs> tournaments sometimes and I play golf. Um, one of the things that I, it's the same thing that a, a player will win a million, million and a half dollars one weekend. And then the next weekend, they won't make the cut to even get in to the tournament. You know, so what happens during that? I, you know, I was able to predict something. I predicted people always ask me, um, I published a little book called Conscious Golf way back in the 90s, which happened to coincide with Tiger Woods getting uh, well known. And I made a prediction at the time. I said, Tiger Woods never had an adolescence. Look out for him to blow it out big time by doing something adolescently stupid in his 20s. Well, wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> and in a way, uh, now this is an even better version of it, but, but not as dramatic. Uh, Jordan Spieth won the $10 million FedEx Cup. And then for the next few years, didn't really do as well as he had before he won it. So what happens there? In his case, he wasn't out partying or drinking or anything like that. I don't know what had happened, but um, he um, didn't have a big blow up like Tiger Woods did. But still, there's this tendency um, to have things happen right after you've had something good happen. So we've got to be really on the lookout for that. Now, if you read The Big Leap, you probably notice that I trace it all down to certain fears that many yes. of us carry around with us. Four and, of them. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you what they are, even I know you know them probably. I do. I'm so excited to talk about these. Yes. <laughs> One of them, which I bet almost all of us, particularly your viewers and your listeners and my viewers and my listeners that buy my books and everything, Almost all of us suffer from what I call a fear of outshining, mm -hmm. which is as kids, we maybe saw that we were maybe a little brighter than some of the other kids. And we got told not to shine our light too much so that other people didn't feel bad. And so we develop this fear of outshining other people. We want everybody to shine just as much as we do. And everybody else wanted everybody else to shine just as brightly as we did. But it didn't work all that way all the time. What happens is the case of a lot of gifted people internalize this fear of really being fully out there, fully realized, fully expressed, because they don't want to steal the light from everybody else. And I want to put that to rest. I just want to look everybody in the virtual eye here and tell them that it's okay to shine your brightest because it doesn't make other people feel bad. What it does is inspire other people, because we need more genius on this planet. We need more people who are willing to go all the way to their full creative contribution to humanity. Mm -hmm. We're in a time that cries out for genius. Mm -hmm. And that's why I had to write these two books, The Big Leap and The, the oh, Genius yeah. Zone, because I just feel like if I ended my life without really making this very clear, I wouldn't be expressing myself fully. So these books almost wrote themselves. I was sitting there doing it at 5 a.m. in the morning, but they mm -hmm. felt like they were coming through me rather than being thought up by me. And that's the best thing to happen as a writer. When you feel like you're being used to write something that's even bigger than you are. And that's yes. the way I feel about the big leap in the genius zone. And the crime about shining, I know in your book, you speak about your relationship with your brother and how that was one of your limiting feelings. You know, I don't want to be too big. You know, what, you know, what about him? What will my parents think? So that's, if you go through the book, that's the fourth, the crime about shining. Can we touch on the other three too? 
Yes. Yes. Another big one is a lot of people fear success, fear going to their full success. For I'll, I'll put two of them together. One is because they fear that success will bring a bigger burden. They already feel burdened and they think, okay, if I get bigger, it's just going to be more burden. Uh, the second one is a lot of limit to, a lot of people limit their growth because they feel like if they really opened up fully and went all the way to their full genius, it would cause them to abandon or leave behind people that were there for them in the past. Mm -hmm. And I have not found that to be true personally. I, um, I've worked with a lot of people that, you know, have won Oscars or won Grammys and things like that. And it really doesn't cause them to leave people behind. What it often does is cause those people to start feeling weird around the person who's been yeah. more successful and it brings up stuff in them. And so I want us to use successful people as an inspiration to us to find out who we really are and what we have to offer, offer in the world. See, I think they're there's something deep in human beings that wants to come out. That genius that we have inside us, it wants to be birthed into the world. It wants to be released in the world. And if we don't, we don't feel good inside. So I think there's a health benefit to opening up to your genius because the more you can feel that kind of whole body, soul depth exhilaration in yourself about what you're doing, it's bound to be good for your health. I know I haven't had, since I dedicated myself to fully to living in my genius full time, mm -hmm. which was about 25 or 30 years ago, I haven't had a cold or the flu in 25 years, which I think is unusual because I used to have a cold a couple of times a year and often get the flu, whatever was going around. But I think something about the way if we use ourselves fully, something happens inside us that that is a health based kind of thing, that kind of a mm -hmm. benign exhilaration that's good for us at the very core of ourselves, even physically good for ourselves. So knock on wood, I uh, hope this year isn't the one I get a cold and blow my whole 25 year record. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, in um, in the new book, The, the uh, Genius Zone, I quote a quote that has become so central to my life. It's a quotation from the Gospel of Thomas, which was one of the apocryphal gospels that didn't make it into the official Bible. It had, I guess, too much radical stuff in it mm. that they didn't bring it into the official Bible. But if you go back and look at it, there's a lot of uh, there's a great book by uh, Elaine Poggles called The Gnostic Gospels. That's a lot about the Gospel of Thomas. But here's one thing it said. Mm -hmm. It says, if you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. But if you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. And I'll tell you, that may sound a little harsh, but I found it to be absolutely true that I've been working with people. I saw my first client in 1968. I'm not much good at math, but uh, how long ago is that? Is that like about A long time ago. ago. <laughs> it's, it's 50, actually somebody's flashing me a cue card here that it's yeah, 53 50. years ago. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what's within us that, oh, sorry, yes. Yes, so mm -hmm. in the past 53 years, I've had the opportunity to see about 20,000 individuals and about eight or 900 business executives and about 5,000 couples. And based on that experience, I will tell you that there's a yearning inside to bring forth our creativity. And it becomes more important the older we get. In fact, Katie and I, uh, my wife, Kathleen Hendricks, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kathleen Hendricks is also named, called Katie around the house here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can call her Katie also. Mm -hmm. And we've co-authored a dozen books together. And our most recent co-authored one is called Conscious Loving Ever After. And it's a book for couples at midlife and beyond, mm -hmm. 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, up into the 80s. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the key premises of the book that we discovered from interviewing tons of couples in that area is that creativity after the age of 40 and particularly after the age of 50 becomes absolutely essential to a marriage, a relationship, as well as to your own individual well-being. In fact, the way we say it here is that every breath you take after you're 40 is a choice between creativity or stagnation. Wow. Creativity or stagnation. Which are you going to breathe with this very moment? I implore everybody that's within my <laughs> eyesight or earshot to choose creativity because it becomes more and more of a big issue in your life if you leave behind your creativity in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. Mm. And when it comes to being creative, a lot of us can feel afraid, right? We can say, oh, what if this is a risk? What if it fails? What if people think I'm silly for, uh, for creating this? And for example, right now I've launched something completely new because I just felt called to do it creatively because I stopped drinking at the beginning of this year as an experiment and I experienced a lot of upside and I put together a workshop because I know people want to do an extended break and I launched it. It's really fun. I'm in the launch phase right now. And I thought to myself, sometimes I think even drinking too much, if that ever happens, and it happens a lot, that is that also an upper limit, right? It I mean, is absolutely an upper limit problem. In fact, mm -hmm. I, in, I ask anybody who partakes mm -hmm. more than a minimal amount of alcohol to mm -hmm. ask themselves to check in and find out if it makes you more creative or less creative because I, I can guess that in 99.9% .9 of the cases, it makes you less creative. Here's the thing, you know, Frank Barron, who is a real uh, student of creativity, uh, Dr. Frank Barron, he wrote books on creativity and everything. Uh, and he did some of the early work on psychedelics, like LSD mm. and things like that, uh, psychological effects of those. And somebody asked him, what's the best drug you've ever taken. And he said, it's alcohol for 15 minutes. And, you know, people just keep trying to go back for that 15 minutes mm. every time. Mm. And of course it doesn't work because, um, you know, yeah, like we they see, used to we say see about, what that does. Yeah, we yeah they that. say the same thing about cocaine too. You know, mm -hmm. cocaine makes you feel like a new man. And what does the new man want? More cocaine. And, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> and right. I, um, I, I've never had a taste for alcohol, so I'm kind of in the dark about that one. Mm -hmm. um, but I was an early pot smoker and I also used to smoke cigarettes when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I've kicked cigarettes and I've, I've kicked those other things, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you, the hardest one to kick was sugar. Right. I think yes. sugar accounts for a lot of people's upper limit problems. Because mm -hmm. if you think about, I don't know if you've ever taken one of those glucose tolerance tests at the doctors yeah. where you drink a glucose thing and then they measure you. I did one of those one time and it was pretty revealing because uh, they give you this little um, glass bottle of a very sugary liquid to drink and you kind of have to chug it down. It's it's gross tasting, but you chug mm -hmm. down this thing like six ounces of liquid or something like that, but it's packed with sugar. And then they measure your blood sugar over the next six hours. Mm. And for about the first half hour, I felt like the king of the world because I had this sugar pumping through my system. A half hour after that, I would, I wanted to take a nap. And then a half hour after that, I went, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so it took me about two hours to recover my sort of normal state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That was a long time ago. And I began to monitor my sugar intake a lot more carefully. And I found that mm. eating is probably one of the main ways we upper limit ourselves. Um, mm. So it doesn't have to be an addictive chemical like uh, alcohol yes. or cocaine or pot or anything like that. It can mm -hmm. be just regular old <laughs> sugar, candy bars, anything that seemingly innocent that things. Blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Seemingly innocent things that are just that uh, that just surround us that people do right. We often just don't question it. I think it's like, well, this is normal. It's normal to drink, or it's normal to and no criticism here, right? If someone drinks, that that's their decision. Eat sugar, their decision. Always personal. But I think sometimes this awareness of an upper limit, I feel like 
for a while when, you know, our business has grown a lot. We've moved here. We're making, you know, a lot of positive changes. I was like, what could another upper limit be? And I'm like, cool. I wonder what could happen if I release this, you know, mm-hmm. and creatively now doing a workshop on it, choosing the creative uh, way of, you know, just going for it versus overthinking it. I, I always just like to come back to um, what, like, what story am I telling about this in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, being an upper limit versus just kind of going with it and trusting and seeing what, like seeing what shows up. And what I love with your work is there's this bias towards action, a bias for more like this. You're coming from this place of yes, Yes, please, more yeah. please. And I want to wrap, I'm touched on the fourth too, because I think this is an important one, because we said there are four main reasons we hit our upper limit. The crime of outshining, thinking success brings another burden, believing we're being disloyal or abandoning people from our past, um, and then feeling fundamentally flawed as humans. Yes, I usually like to save that for last, because mm-hmm. it's in a way the most compelling, deep in darkening aspect of our belief system that if you yeah. feel like you're fundamentally wrong, bad, sick, or stupid, mm-hmm. any of those, mm-hmm. anything you feel bad about yourself becomes a self-perpetuating prophecy that then mm-hmm. brings more experiences like that. Mm-hmm. It's like um, this game my brother and I used to play when we were kids uh, about spotting cars when we were on vacation my brother would say, okay, uh, pick a color of cars and whoever gets the most over the next hour wins. I forgot what we played for, but um, Mm -hmm. he would always pick white. We lived in Florida. He knew something that I didn't know because in Florida, rent-a-cars are about 99% white. And Mm -hmm. so there would always be in Florida tons of white cars on the road. And I would usually pick some color I liked, you know, like blue or red, and there would never be any of those, Mm -hmm. but he would always rack it up. So if you're looking for a particular sort of thing in life, either consciously or unconsciously, you're going to see that thing and block out other things. Mm -hmm. And so that's oftentimes what happens when people feel fundamentally bad about themselves, or to be more specific, a lot of us feel fundamentally undeserving of love. Yes. That something has happened in our past. Somebody has convicted us of an imaginary crime, you know, like being unwanted or Mm-hmm. Um, you know, being or unloved. making a mistake that was unacceptable. Making, yes. Yeah. Also, like your family, like I come from a family, we were on welfare, we lived in different shelters at different times. And I always thought, like, oh, people can't know about that. Like, because mm. that's mm-hmm. that's not okay. So if I that's why I love to talk about it <laughs> now. Yeah. I'm very open about it because I'm like, if this is the truth, and and you know, a lot of that wasn't my fault, you know, and there were blessings there for sure, uh, then maybe that helps. Right. It helps me. It helps others. I know. And it's amazing, isn't it? How you would start there and end up doing what you do in Miami, Florida. You know, I, that's a I, miracle in itself. <laughs> I know. And then I always think, you know, I always think with my upper limits now, I'm like, what else? And I love this question. I mean, I don't even need to look it up, but I do. I just want to just read the exact words here. But how much love and ab- abundance am I willing to allow? Right. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I allow all of it, but I'm like, but do I? <laughs> you know, because sometimes yeah. you'll you'll pay attention to the critics, you'll read the comments, you'll check your likes, you'll get some bad feedback, and you'll it, it can unravel you for a couple of hours, you know, and for a couple of days, sometimes, or a couple of a couple a of bad rejection of some sort. Yeah, and you actually list a lot of upper limit behaviors here, which I love. And my friends, let's be honest with ourselves: worrying, blame and criticism, getting sick or hurt, squabbling, hiding significant feelings, not keeping agreements, not speaking significant truths to the relevant people, deflecting. In fact, um, sometimes I even think not being able to receive someone's generosity is an upper limit problem. Would you agree with that? I would totally agree with that. I uh, I think I tell a story in The Big Leap, maybe it's one of the books about trying to give my mother-in-law a, com- a compliment yes. about her pie. Mm-hmm. And it, it she was very close to that sort of thing. And I, I kept, you know, Polly, that pie was delicious. And then she would say, oh, I don't think so. I don't think I put enough, uh, whatever it was, pumpkin in it or something. And uh, I said, no, it was just perfect for me. And then she would say, no, you should have seen what my mother used to be able to make. I can't make a pie to save my neck, you know? And so <laughs> finally I just gave up. You know? Receive it. Just, it. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. But you touched on something really, really important here that we all need to look at. See, I think a lot of people in our field are 
stuck on the receiving part of the equation rather than the giving part of the equation. That most of us, you know, that, that enjoy conversations like this, that enjoy transformation, that, that like to see positive things happen. You know, we're on a certain wavelength and I think being on that wavelength makes us a certain way, you know, because we're interested in contribution and we're interested yeah. in making a positive difference. But what we need to get also is to get good at receiving, mm -hmm. because how many life coaches and people like that do you know that are just barely scraping by, you know, they haven't really mm -hmm. had a, a wave of abundance in their life. So here's the thing is you have to start where you are and say, okay, where I am right now is the amount of abundance and genius I'm willing to live in. Now, let me begin to expand from here. And what we do is we ask you to simply expand first 10 minutes a day. Uh, like when people come here uh, to work with us for a full day intensive or a three day, it, uh, we do something where corporations will sometimes send a, a CEO or somebody here to uh, kind of get a big one day hit and uh, it's a it's a twenty thousand dollar package they get, but the first thing they get for their twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars is ten minutes. We ask them to go in a little room by themselves, or not even a picture on the wall, mm -hmm. and sit there and ask themselves for ten minutes. Hmm, what is my true genius? Hmm, mm -hmm. what do I most love to do? So there's a little $20,000 gift for all your listeners and viewers. Just go in a room yes. and take 10 minutes because you know, a lot of times these people that run big companies, they'll come walking out with a look in their eye and they say, man, I wish I'd done that 30 years ago. You know, it's the first time they've ever really asked themselves that kind of a question. And that's the beauty, I think, of life that spiritual growth and manifestation don't have to move linearly through time. You can have a suddenly a, a sudden awakening where you say, oh my goodness, I do deserve love. Mm. I deserve full abundance. And you, you know, you kind of wake up out of the trance of your upper limits. That's what I, I did 30, 35 years ago is kind of wake up out of my own upper limits trances. Mm -hmm. And what I did was just begin to take baby steps. I I think first I set the intention of having spending 30% of my time in my genius zone where mm -hmm. I was doing what I most love to do. Mm -hmm. And that took me a, you know, a year or two to get up to there, but then I set 50% of my time. That was a big, bold one. Then in the 1990s, I set the intention of by the end of the century, I'd be spending all my time in my genius zone. Mm -hmm. And I made it by the end of the century and have been for the last 20 some years, I spend, you know, 90% of my time that I, you know, I, I, there are some things I do. I mentioned in the book, like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm boss of the kitty litter here in this house and I'm boss of taking out the trash bins and mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of thing. So I have my chores. I wouldn't say I'm a genius at kitty litter maintenance, but I do it because I, I love my cats. And mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> but 90% of the time during my waking hours, I'm doing something like this or, if you'd mm -hmm. looked in my window at 6 a.m., you'd see me writing till 7.30. And mm. so I'm doing things that are in my genius zone pretty much all the time. Wow, that's a good feeling. You know, maybe, I guess. maybe mm -hmm. yeah, I cannot recommend it highly enough. I feel like this, for some people, would be like, that would be so amazing and yet not possible for me. They'd say, you know, but I have to, like, I have to do this. I can't afford to outsource this or that yet. Um, it's, you know, all these things I need to do. And sometimes I know that we can cling to the behind the scenes stuff or the stuff that doesn't, uh, that, that isn't unique to you because it maybe feels safe. It doesn't, there isn't a creativity piece that's required. It doesn't require any courage. Um, do you believe too that that's also just an upper limit, believing what's possible in terms of how we can spend our time? Because, yeah, you know, it, it's a rare thing to meet somebody who's like, oh yeah, I kind of pretty much do things I love. That's my mm -hmm. week, you know? <laughs> uh, 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 you know, what, uh, how, what do you do? Oh, I love my career. Oh my gosh, I get to, whatever it may be. This is by far the exception <laughs> versus <laughs> the rule, right? In terms of how people just show up. Even people who run their own companies, a lot of them are my friends, and they'll be like, oh, but I have to manage the team, and I have to do the PL, and I have to. So like, how do you approach those kind of um, just very fixed beliefs? Yes. 
I recommend that people study carefully any of their if only I didn't have tos. Mm. So because how many people have you met that say something like, I'd love to write a book if I didn't have to fill in the blank. And it's and it's something, you know, something real if I didn't have to work eight hours a day or if I weren't exhausted from taking care of my kids all day or if I wasn't uh, out of a job, you know. So but that's why we start with 10 minutes a day because mm -hmm. everybody can find 10 minutes a day to focus on their genius. And if you focus on it 10 minutes a day, you'll find it is a positive addiction. You'll want to spend 15 minutes in your genius. Then you'll want to spend a half, then you want to spend an hour. And as your genius unfolds, the means to keep it going will reveal themselves. For example, you'll see somebody who's doing a good job at something you hate to do. And you'll say, hey, can I hire you for five hours a week to do dot, dot, dot. And that's how we started. You know, mm -hmm. we started out with one half-time personal assistant mm -hmm. way back. I think it was in the days before personal assistants even were called personal assistants. Right, <laughs> secretaries, yeah, they were, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this was more of a gopher person, you know, a person right. who would go for coffee, go to the copy shop to make copies. This was in the yeah. days before we could afford our own copy machine, you know, and I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but I, be, I, I, I invite people to be very, very aware of those if only I didn't have to's because they can be seductive traps. Mm -hmm. So sit down with a good listening friend or a good counselor or a good therapist or a good life coach and say, I wanna spend an hour getting clear of all my ifs, buts, shoulds, and have tos that are in the way of expressing my full genius. Mm. I bet you could, in an hour of concentrating ah. on that, remove 90% of them. Because here's the thing, most of them are in our heads. They're not in actual reality. Yes. Um, I know of a famous uh, woman who writes uh, romance novels. And she writes them under an assumed name. So I'm not going to even tell you. Okay. What <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> uh, but uh, she does it from midnight to four. Wow. Midnight to four. Wow. I can't even hatch a reasonable thought after about 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> I can't even watch TV at midnight. I know. <laughs> my, wife, my wife has shows she watches at 10 o'clock. I hear them out of my ear while I'm asleep, you know. <sighs> uh, I very rarely make it till even 10.30, even if it's a very exciting detective show. <sighs> uh, but so here's the thing. Yeah. She has another job. I mean, not a job, but she, she has a... Other commitments. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she has a special needs child. I'll put it that mm -hmm. way. That mm -hmm. takes up a tremendous amount of hands-on energy you know and then to sit there from 12 to 4 and crank out in the morning and crank out fantasy no i mean romance novel that's mind-boggling to me that's how human yeah. beings can get committed to their genius mm. and so one of these days one of her romance novels is probably going to take off and they make a movie out of it or something and she'll yes, be it will. Uh, you know like jk rowling living in a castle or something but mm -hmm. until then she's happy to just fuel her creativity with some extra coffee and do it till 4 a.m. And so yes, I, I admire the heck out of that. Me too. And I, we need to seek out these stories. We need to see what is happening and pay attention because no one else is going to do this for you, right? I mean, sometimes we'll, we'll think, okay, so spend 10 minutes. It's okay saying 10 minutes, my friends, right? Like 10 minutes, the things I could do, if only I didn't have to, right? Come up with the list. Let's look at our reasons, right? No one else is going to do this for you, right? There's not like a day of reckoning where someone's going to come to your house, knock on the door and say, okay, zone of genius time, my friend. You have been, you know, hitting a hard too long, doing too much, taking on too many burdens. Like it's your time. You <laughs> have to do this. And 
like 10 minutes, this question, it's surprising, you know, how, how rarely we even think that this is possible, just kind of tapping into what is available and it's just another way of being. But that's also an apple of it, right? That's also, you know, oh, I, get, I can't do that. That's people who have the luxury of help and the luxury, it's like four, 10 to four, right? With a special needs child, there are people who are out there doing the things that we dream of doing because they're giving themselves the permission to go for it. They're not seeing the limit. That we're seeing and okay one thing that i love that you explain in the book is the russian doll method of looking for your zone of genius are you able to share that for a moment yes uh, you know how these little uh russian doll sets are a doll within a doll within a doll mm -hmm. and you have to go looking for your genius that way because down in the center of everything is mm -hmm. the sweet spot of what you most love to do and mm -hmm. what will bring you the greatest abundance and life satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So that is the creative essence of ourselves. That's the pure little nugget that's down there of gold that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you may peel off layers or go through layers of what you think are your genius, but you have to keep going deeper and deeper until you find that sweet spot. Like mm -hmm. for me, I got trained as a, as a traditional clinical and counseling psychologist. I got my doctorate at Stanford in 1974, and I went on to become a professor of counseling psychology at the University of Colorado for 21 years. And then, uh, as my wife and I put it, one day Oprah waved her magic wand over a couple of university professors, and suddenly we were on her show with our book, Conscious Loving, and life turned into a, uh, a space shuttle ride for the past 30 years. But um, so, but there was a time when I remember this conversation with one of my professors at Stanford, and he was saying, which are you going to head toward? Are you going to head toward being a private practice psychologist, or are you going to head toward being a university professor? Mm. And I said, well, sitting in an office for 40 hours a week seems like suicide to me. I'm never going to do that. I could not possibly pull that off. Some people are just born to sit in their office for 40 hours a week. And I'm born to sit in my chair for about as long as it takes me to do this interview. Here. Yes. <laughs> and I got to do something else. And so uh, I spent my entire elementary and high school looking at the clock to see when the class was going to be over. So uh, I said, that's not going to do for me. I'm going to be a university professor. But I'll tell you what I'm really interested in. And he said, oh, what? Because in his mind, that was it. There was only these two paths that he trained mm -hmm. people for. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I think we're in a marketing phase. We need to get this stuff out to the people. We need to be doing shows on cable TV and uh, PBS. And so this was long before they started having those kind of shows on public television. And this was even before there was such a thing called a self-help book. So um, I was around when the first self-help books were actually written, wrote one of the first ones of myself. But in the, the conversation I'm talking about, long before that came along. And so I said, I can see a day where we're out doing seminars on these kind of things, not like teaching university classes, but regular people that don't even have a high school degree could learn in a room that. PhDs and MDs are sitting in. It doesn't matter. We want to, and here was my magic word. I said, we need to democratize therapy and transformation so everybody can get hold of it. So you don't have to just go into an office somewhere. And I remember the look he was giving me. It was almost like I was saying, uh, suggesting public nudity in America <laughs> or something like that. You know, he, he was sort of looking at me like, what? You know, like, what are you talking about? And, well, God bless him. You know, he had come up in a particular tradition. Yes. And so he only saw the world in, you know, two different life paths because he would trained mm -hmm. 100 other PhD students and they'd gone into one of those two life paths. So anyway, what I'm saying is no matter where you are, be asking yourself the big question about, how could you see it actually being different? You know, what would it take to really turn you on? Well, I became a university professor, so I took that path, but I became the first person at the university to teach a class on developmental psychology 
over their cable TV uh, system that they had. And so I was able to have people all over Colorado in my class rather than just the 40 people that were sitting in the studio with me. Mm -hmm. And suddenly that became very popular because the dean suddenly realized, wow, I had 80 paying customers in that class, 40 of which weren't even in there, not even taking up space. Hmm, mm. that could work. And so pretty soon, you know, they're offering uh, degrees online. <laughs> that uh, kind of thing, so. And here we are. And here we are in 2021, where you do a live television segment from your home. Like in oh, I know it. I love national it. television. It's incredible. But this isn't this because we've had to lose, I mean, when you think about your vision back then, and it's like, you know, psychiatrist or professor, it's very easy to adopt other people's limits for us too, without being conscious. Absolutely. Right. In fact, that's yeah. where most of them come from. We just take them by osmosis. We just kind of live, uh, grow up living inside a certain limitation. And then we take that on. Um, mm -hmm. Like a, a colleague of mine tells a story about, uh, you know, she was at Thanksgiving or one of the holiday dinners, uh, with her mother and um, I mean, uh, with, uh, with her sister and her sister was carving off the end of the ham to put it in this pan, but it was actually, the pan was big enough to hold the whole thing. So, but she carved off the end of it, set it beside the, um, the ham. And uh, my colleague said, why did you, why, why do we always cut the end off the ham? And they ended up calling the mother way back in Florida or someplace and said, why do we always cut, you always cut the end off the ham. And she said, oh, you know, it was because granny, her mother, the pan didn't fit. You know, the ham wouldn't fit in the pan. And so, <laughs> so they got three generations of ham hacking because of one person's <laughs> ill-fitting pan a long time ago. Oh, and think about this. I mean, this is ham. That's not that serious, right? You lose a bit of meat. But when you think about our lives, like, you know, I grew up hearing um, rich people are evil, right? Like uh, money doesn't grow on trees. The only way out of, you know, a situation is if you have a, if you have a bit of luck. You need a little bit of luck to help you get by. And that always just felt a little bit wrong. You know, I'm like, well, I'm a human being on earth. And back in the day, we used to get a lot of um, donations from Sunday schools and also from churches. And so we went to Sunday schools. And I remember listening, even just to some of the different services, you know, you can do all things. We are powerful. We're all equal. And I remember thinking that just doesn't fit with what I hear you know, from my family. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how I feel, I feel like young us is wise. <laughs> right like you know, like when you see each other like i want to be an astronaut and i'm going to do that and i'm going to marry leonardo dicaprio actually he's you know justin bieber whoever it may be it's like these are it's kind of what we believe what we believe is possible however frivolous it sounds then but it's almost like an unlearning right the mm -hmm. big leap like learning some unlearning some of the things that haven't been helpful to fulfill why we're here that that's how i look yes. at your work well, thank you. One of the things that I think is one of the biggest factors in human growth is openness to learning. Mm, you know, that yes. if you can keep yourself open to learning from every relationship interaction, from things that come your way, that's really the best stance to take toward life. Kind of an attitude of, uh, here I am, here's what I'd like, and I'm open to whatever can happen to assist me in that. Mm -hmm. That's, to me, life only begins once we get beyond our upper limit problem, because before then you're running on somebody else's limitations. There doesn't have anything to do with you. It has to do with somebody else's life. But yes. the moment you can break through and start asking yourself some big questions like, hmm, what is my genius? What do I most love to do? What brings out the best in me? What am I happiest while I'm doing? And start focusing a little more of your life on doing those kinds of things. It has a kind of a liberation about it that's hard to find anywhere else in life. Oh, yes. And when, because I work with a lot of people when it comes to growing their businesses and becoming more visible and fulfilling, you know, bigger goals, making more impact. What would you tell someone, Gay, who says, you know, I really want, okay, just say it's to become an author, right? Uh, who to, to, you know, like your friend, to, to be, become a very successful author and impact people with my, just say it's fiction, right? To move people and entertain them with my fiction. What if, what if our desire for that and our belief that you just can't, you, you, you just can't reconcile them. It just, it feels too out there. Like you recognize you have an upper limit problem. 
and you, you, you recall your desire, but your desire doesn't bring you joy because you're like, hmm, it's definitely, you know, it's my vision, but I just, I don't know how I can get there. Like the programming, it just, it still feels too heavy or there just still feels like there's, there's like an ocean between you and your dream. How would you start to chip away at that? I mean, or what would you be your method for beginning? Trust baby steps, focus on baby steps, F focus on things that you can do this moment or things that you can do within the next 10 minutes that foster your genius. Go in a room by yourself if you've got 10 minutes and doodle the, doodle the question, what is my genius? If you don't know what it is, you know, just open up that dialogue with your genius. Baby steps, 10 minutes, you know, or yes. even, I always say, all you need is one positive thought about a given area and that points you in the right direction. So at some point you said to yourself, hey, wait a minute, just because I started out poor or living in a shelter mm -hmm. doesn't mean now I can't live in a great place mm -hmm. or it doesn't mean I can't have a great life. Somewhere you got the idea that 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 sort of didn't matter that you could invent something in the present. And to me, that's one of the most powerful things in life is that, you know, unless you're being tied down and mm -hmm. uh, have people piling on you un under a blanket or something, almost all of us have the power to say, hmm, what do I want? Or, hmm, what do I most love to do? It's, mm -hmm. it's part of our freedom that we don't often take advantage of. Mm -hmm. I'm in the habit of asking big questions, even when I'm sitting around, uh, like I, w when I used to fly on airplanes a lot, not for the past year or so, but uh, mm -hmm. when I used to fly on airplanes all the time, I have some of the great conversations of my life with somebody sitting next to me. Like I once sat, sat next to the head of the company that makes uh, ramen noodles, those little packages that used to cost five for a dollar, you know, yeah. and I was asking him, you know, how the heck do you make something and get it to the supermarket, five of those for a dollar? Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, I lose money on every one of those I sell. And I said, oh, how you stay in business? And he explained a whole bunch of things to me over a two hour flight wow. that I would have never thought of in a million years about you know, loss leaders, he's willing to yes. lead with a loss to get something else into the supermarket. And I mean, it was levels yeah. of genius about business that I had never in a million years occurred. So go through life with that kind of, hey, what's, you know, what can I learn attitude? What can I learn? Well, it turned out he gave me an MBA in business and a two hour uh, flight we were on. I like to talk to people on planes too. I just love people. <laughs> one, thing, one thing that I've loved about your work, which I just really, uh, I, I just feel is so sometimes, you know, lacking a little bit out there, which is something that I always strive to do too, which is to sometimes make things that feel very heavy and big and insurmountable a little easier. <laughs> right a little lighter a little bit a little bit more possible and not through doing deep heavy work necessarily but you said one positive thought one one um, not long ago I was just speaking with someone who's like I don't know how and I'm like you don't have to do it alone haven't there been other times you didn't know how to do things and then you you take a take a first step clarity comes through action bit by bit right it's it's so uh, it, it's so interesting how quickly we just abdicate our power and say no, like this is it for me. <laughs> nothing left, nothing left to learn. You know, oh, I'm at a certain age. This, you know, this is my future. We're we're so willing and happy to do that when we're we're just such powerful beings. And I think human ingenuity, like human innovation, our ideas, isn't this the gold? <laughs> like it, it's it's incredible taking back that power. You know, taking back the power over. You know, I was just thinking about a good friend of mine um, that I play golf with sometimes. He said that speaking one sentence changed his entire life. 17 years ago, after 20 years of blackout drinking, he got up in front of a group of people and said, hi, my name is Jim and I'm an alcoholic. And he'd spent years denying that he had a drinking problem. But that sentence... Mm just getting that sentence out of his mouth and making a commitment to not take a drink that day. That's the kind of one positive thought that I'm talking about, you know, just one step in the right direction can often now here he is 17 
years later, he's a multimillionaire, he's wow. playing golf whenever he wants. And so things like that to me are just the, the most juicy things about human life. I get to live on a steady diet of miracles because of the work I do. But still, when somebody tells me something like that, you know, it still just warms my heart. Me too. And I think to myself, sometimes you even just look at the earth, right? We were 80% water, right? The, the earth itself. And we don't know 90% of what's in the ocean at our, beneath a certain level. How can we be cynical? Yeah. <laughs> like, we don't even know enough. Like we don't know anything. And we're so quick to know everything and to be like, well, that's wrong. This is a problem. There's another problem that's coming up. Wait, did you think about that problem? it's like your steady diet of miracles i feel that way too the fact the sun rises every morning or just think just think that you and i i mean there are almost nine million species on this planet and you and i are the only one that can have a conversation about upper limits and luck and things like that Mm. i mean half Uh. the species are bugs you know, so we ex- we have this exalted position. We can do these amazing things. Yes. It's like I said in the Big Leap. It's like we are in he- we are born as a Learjet airplane that can fly at forty thousand feet, but we use it to plow potatoes with. You know, up and down the potato field um, instead of soaring to our uh, heights that we can soar to. Mm, and the question that you love to ask is, how good are you willing to feel? How good right, are you the, willing to feel? How much is, love are you willing to feel? How much abundance are you willing to feel? Or, and do you believe too that when we open ourselves up, the world will then just match it? Like the world could match our level of openness to what it is we're willing to receive. Is this what you see in your work? Yes, there's a wonderful quotation from the author Franz Kafka. He says, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to... All you have to do is sit still, very quiet, simple, and ordinary. He says, the universe will roll in ecstasy at your feet if you just allow yourself to receive. But most of the time, we're out there in front, you know, kind of pushing hustle, on hustle, life. Hustle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's like says in the James Joyce novel, Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body, you know, because we're always out there out in front of the moment, you know, kind of hustling, trying to get to the next thing when we need to just drop back into this moment and appreciate the miracle of existence itself. And that invites a flow of blessings that I haven't ever managed to, um, you know, I, I, I can't conceive of the magnificence of that because it's happening all the time around me. Mm, I I completely agree. And I, I also love to ask whenever I'm even just, you know, speaking with a group or whoever it may be or a stranger, how many of the blessings of your life just came to you? Right. You many blessings to we, you know, we, we, we take the action, the great things happen. But also, I mean, I met my husband at a concert like very and we both almost didn't go right a lot of the ideas that I have they just they come to me when I'm walking and or opportunities they flow they it it, you know yeah I can do my reach out and I love to take the action for sure participate in my own blessings but also the the biggest opportunities have been like a phone call an email hey Susie and I'm like aha look what I've allowed (laughs) (laughs) I love I I heard somebody maybe it was you actually that said this uh you know exchange the word achieve and accomplish with allow like look Mm. what look what that person's allowed I don't know but if I did say it I'm glad I said it (laughs) (laughs) I love that it's a lot about receiving now tell me (laughs) what kind of a concert was it Oh, it was an Australian band when I was living in Sydney. He was living in Sydney, a band called Sneaky Sound System. And like I said, we both almost didn't go. And it just, it was a complete chance encounter. Mm-hmm. And I mean, another friend of mine, unexpectedly, she's she found out she's pregnant recently. She was a bit surprised at first. Now she's like, what a blessing. That just happened, right? So many things, they can just happen to us. But we have to be open, right? That's our work, to remain, to remind ourselves of who we are. Right. I mean, Gay, I I could talk to you for three hours, clearly, <laughs> nonstop about many things. But already it's, it's been a, a, an hour has lapsed. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? I, I of course, want to talk about all of your links and, you know, um, the Genius Zone, which is coming up shortly. But um, is there anything that you'd like to leave this conversations with for us to think about? We're only a breath away from our full magnificence every moment. So just keep taking those big breaths in favor of your creativity and your genius and allow to happen what happens and uh, watch the miracles unfold. 
watch the miracles unfold. Oh my gosh. Okay. Thank you. Truly. Thank you so much. What a blessing to me. This has been spending time with you. My gosh, I've been looking forward to it for so long since we, since we planned it. So the genius zone coming out in June available for pre-order now everywhere books yes. are sold. Yes, it is. And thanks a lot, Susie. And uh, let's reconvene maybe after the new book is out. Please. Absolutely. And if someone wants to work with you, work with your team, hire you in some way, Hendrix.com. Is that correct? Yes. Hendrix.com, H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S.com. And also I should mention our um, uh, website that has our relationship uh, e-courses and things. It's called heartsinharmony.com, heartsinharmony.com. So that's where you can find out all our things for singles and couples. Oh, thank you so much, Gay. What a pleasure and a privilege to spend time with you. I cannot wait to hopefully speak to you again and continue our fabulous conversation. So thank you very, very much. Thank you for living. Thank you for living in your genius. Bye now. <laughs> oh my gosh, Gay, thank you. Wow. I could truly, I could talk to you for hours and hours. Like, what? <laughs> I'm sure everyone says this to you. They want to keep you forever. <laughs> Somebody else wants to talk to me in about 10 seconds. So oh, okay. All right. I will let you go. But truly, thank you. And can I get an advanced copy of your book so I can share it with my audience? Yes. Um, Margaret? Give, Mar give Margaret a physical address. You're in touch with Margaret, right? Yes. Yeah, she's great. Uh, yeah, she's great. And yeah. um, give her your physical address and tell her you want to get an advanced copy of the book. And she's keeping a list. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. That's very... Are you doing a, a tour or event? Or I mean, I know COVID is still a bit tricky, but... Yeah, I'm not. I'm doing a couple of physical events, but I'm doing mostly virtual, virtual okay. book tour. Well, I'd love to share it with my audience. My audience is pretty big now, so well, well, my email list is two hundred and fifty thousand people. Well, we'll get so. you um, as soon as the, uh, I get. I'm supposed to get some re, uh, uh, PR copies. Let's see, what's today? No, oh, it, it's Today's not the until 20th, May. The 19th. I, think, I think the second week of May. So I'll get one to you as soon as we get hold of them. Fantastic. And I'm also a columnist for lots of different media. So I'm, I'm going to see too where I can um, uh, weave in your work to stuff that I'm working on. So Perfect. Also, uh, I'll give your name to the um, publicist at St. Martin's Press, my publisher for this book, because um, they may have some other uh, Fantastic. Thanks. Yes. We need your we need your mind. More, 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 more. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a privilege, pleasure spending time with you. Enjoy your afternoon and we'll connect again soon, I hope. Thanks, Susie. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.